Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Welcome to Lodi Whittier Library's Tales and Tales Poetry and Prose Reading. The work that you will hear was all gathered this summer during our call for submissions. These pieces and others, along with short bios and photos, are available on our library's website, lodilibrary.net. Thank you, Beth, for setting all of that up. This reading is being recorded and will soon be available on our library's YouTube channel. We are so thankful for all of our contributors. This is a wonderful and diverse selection of work. When each reader begins, please mute yourselves so we have less audio interference, but please show your appreciation with the chat function or use the emoticons available on the lower right of your screen. I was going to begin with, because I'm the children's librarian, I felt the need to do a children's book. I was going to do serious poetry, but I don't think I will. This is called A New Green Day by Antoinette Portis. And it's pretty neat because first, there's a small selection and you have to guess who is speaking. So we'll see. We'll see how you guys do. Morning lays me on your pillow. An invitation square and warm, come out and play. Any guesses? You can shout if you want. Says the sunlight. <laughs> the cat, Carol says. <laughs> I scribble on the walk in glistening ink. Read all about my nighttime travels. Ooh, close, Carol. That was my guess, too. It's an animal if that helps. The moon, very close. Says the snail. It's a glistening snail trail. I'm a map of my own green home. Follow my roads and climb. Squirrel. A leap. <laughs> When I move, I measure. I'll count out tickles across my hand. Measure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Carol guess it. Sure. <laughs> I'm a candy sucked smooth in the river's mouth. Let me sweeten your pocket. We're going to get this one. <laughs> Says the pebble. <laughs> Oops. It's not a book you want to skip a page. I'm a mountain that moves. Look, I come to you. Ellie, it's okay, you're bad at it. <laughs> I knew one, I knew the inchworm. Says the cloud. I'm a chorus of million tiny voices. Come splash in my song. Is the rain. Okay, I got this one too, so maybe you guys will. I slash the sky with my bright fangs. Warning, run inside. I can bite a tree in two. Lightning. Go, Harry. <laughs> there she I'm the rumble in the stomach of the storm. Pardon me, I must be something I ate. <laughs> Thunder. Very good. Harry's on a roll, watch out. <laughs> I've suffered through all of them so much out here, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. I am cool pudding on a muggy day. Let your toes have a taste. 
I'm not going to guess anymore, but. Carol. Says the mud. I race up the hill while lying at your feet. Wave at me and I'll wave at you. <laughs> I'm a black coat slipped around the earth's shoulders. Count my shiny buttons. That's a night. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to make it to first grade. I know I am. I know. I'm feeling that, definitely. I am the engine of the summer dark. Sleep while I thrum in your tomorrow. Carol, Carol and Harry, you're, you're tied, I think. Cricket. <laughs> Sorry about that. I kind of like the way you spelled it because it sounds like a cricket. Cricket. I was going to say either dream or conscience, actually. <laughs> So now that we're done with the, the bedtime story, our first reader is Nancy Defoe. Thank you, Nora. Thanks for having us tonight too. I was originally gonna read my children's story, um, The Hummingbird, H.T. Hummingbird, A Poet in the Trees, but I decided I wanted to read um, from my new novella, Neiman Ajmal on Newton's Mountain. It just came out. And it's in a story in two parts. Uh, it's about a mother and child who are separated in war and the mother's realistic journey and the child's journey who is cared for by animals. And I'm just picking up right in the middle. Sala, the great black horse, strode up to Ajmal, lowering his magnificent head with long mane. Ajmal reached his hand out and stroked the stallion's narrow face. They instantly liked one another. You will take him the rest of the way, said Faraj, but first this boy must rest. We have journeyed a long way together without the benefit of your strong legs. Will you miss me? Ajmal asked of Faraj. I knew with the others, but you've been harder to read. Then I have taught you well. That's your answer? Snakes are never very cuddly creatures, even in Perterra, said Faraj. But if you must know, you will be missed. He wound around Ajmal's left leg before loosening himself again. Ajmal smiled. I will miss you too. Does that surprise you? Not at all. You are more transparent than you suspect. Now I have to greet my old friend Sala and say goodbye. Faraj slithered around some dry brush before disappearing. Goodbye, Faraj, Ajmal said then added my friend. He built and stoked a small fire, then sat down and curled up next to it, listening to Sala discuss his journeys for a few minutes before drifting off to sleep. As Ajmal dreamed, he heard Sala say, are you telling me this young man could possibly make a difference in their violent, chaotic world? What power does he have? Without us, he would long ago have perished, as well as their fractured lands. He has the power to inspire love, Faraj said. Look how we've set everything aside for him, as his mother once did. I had absolutely no intention of growing fond of him, and yet I have. He must be very powerful then. Perhaps he will change them. I suspect it is not the boy who will change the world, said Faraj. It will be his mother, but he will play an important part. He is needed in some way we do not yet understand. Thank you. I loved hearing a piece of your new novella. Um, when you get a chance, if you could put the title in the chat, just so people can refer back. Thank you so much for sharing that, Nancy. Thank you. Um, 
Next up was Judith Pratt. She hasn't arrived yet. So I think we're gonna go straight to you, Harry, if that's okay. And maybe pull in Judith later if she shows up. Sure. So this is Harry McHugh. Thank you so much for participating, Harry. Sure, thanks for having me. So I, I have two things. Uh, one is a story uh, and the other is uh, a, mental, a more of a, a poem, so. The first one is about, I always wanted chickens. I always wanted animals. I really was attracted to having animals and loved going to a farm and everything. So finally, it took quite a while, but um, I made my wish come true. So this is my first introduction to Harry gets his, finally gets his chickens. <clears throat> I have been dreaming of having chickens all my life. Doesn't everyone? Okay, maybe not everyone. But Ann and I were ready to raise some baby chicks. She was my first wife. Um, when we saw an ad in the Mother Earth News <clears throat> from Murray McMurray of Clinton, Iowa, we put in our order for 25 day old chicks, the mixed exotic breeds collection. We thought we should mention it to our landlord, Mr. Youngers. We were just uh, renting a farmhouse up in, near Warsaw, New York. <clears throat> Where were you planning to put them, he asked. In the kitchen, I answered, but fenced in with a cardboard fence, which they sell in the feed store in town. You know, Cooper, Hemingway, and Rowley. Where will you keep them when they grow up, asked Mr. Y. I have a set of plans I bought when I was about nine or 10. Have you ever built a, a building before, Harry? No, I fixed the chicken house up as, as when I was a kid, but my father said I couldn't get the chickens. Mr. Y, you can get them chickens and build your hen house, but when you leave, I'll keep that hen house. You get that? Harry, yup. Mr. Youngers, you'll need a 50 pound bag of bran to put on the kitchen floor for bedding. I had bought plans for a chicken house at Phil Sherlock's Hardware in Bedford when I was a kid, and now I was about to use it. Yeehaw! Off to the lumber yard I went with my 10-year-old plans to fulfill, finally, my 4-H club dream. The lumber yard truck pulled in the yard with all my building supplies, and I started to build my first farm structure. My hammering brought the Youngers, then the Flints, than anyone else that was around with a hammer over the ensuing days to help me into the poultry business. The comically cranky postmaster, complete with his trifocal pince nez glasses, called a few weeks later to say that he had come, that I better come and get these damn baby chicks out of his office. <clears throat> this guy was like a cranky old geezer guy from Central Casting, and he said when I picked up the chickens, damn it. They keep singing the same tune, get them out of here. The 30 chicks we bought joined us night and day in the kitchen for about, uh, for a few weeks, <clears throat> kept warm by their faux broody mother hen and infrared bulb hung from the kitchen table. Then it was time to move them to the new chicken house, complete with their heat light to keep them warm in between eating, drinking, cheeping and pooping. Eight weeks later, they were pullets and cockerels bopping around outside in a fenced in run 10 feet square and knowing their way back home into the new coop. We had a number of different varieties and were learning which ones were good egg layers, and which ones had other characteristics, both good and bad. What does a chicken have to do to get put on the bad list? Fighting would be one bad habit, attacking guests would be another. We ordered what we called a what was called a straight run, meaning there were cockerels and hens, hens for the eggs and the cockerels for the roasting. We kept one rooster we named Gray Ghost. He was a really great looking guy with a light blue gray body and a good attitude. He was a, bland, a blue Andalusian. We had him for a few years. Then some visitors from school came one Sunday afternoon with their dog. And as we were greeting them, the dog attacked Gray Ghost and wounded him so badly that I had to kill him. They were sorry, but stayed for dinner, a chicken dinner. 
le fait poule à la grille fantôme. In other words, the gray ghost was dinner. And the second piece I have it is uh, just, uh, it's kind of, well, you'll see. It's called snowshoes. Uh, and a, a little background on me was I was working in a place there was, I was a lumberjack for a while working with horses, pulling out logs and stuff. So anyway, uh, it's called snowshoes. I'm reminded of two, two more winter memories in the woods. Um, as pre I'm sorry, I was preceded by other interesting things that happened in the woods. For Christmas one year, Anne's mother, Fran, sent me a beautiful set of ash wood snowshoes from L.L. Bean. One Sunday afternoon, after a deep powdery new layer of snow, I decided to take a stroll up the hill and see how these snappy new snowshoes worked out for me. I had walked about a quarter mile up the hill when I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye directly to my left. I stopped and looked across the snowy field toward the neighbor's woods about 30 yards away. Sure enough, an animal came out of the woods. Oh, a lynx. It was magnificent looking and was unaware of me. It slowly pranced along up the deep snow to the deep snow its, its furry feet kicking up puffs of soft, glittering snow as it, its movement so exaggerated as if each step was choreographed, the powdery snow enhancing these steps like a toe-weighted saddle-bred dressage equine. We continued to walk along together, each of us walking at the same pace. About two minutes up the slope, my hiking buddy, the lynx, went back into the woods. The sun, the kicked up snow, the glimmering effinescent powder, the snow and the lynx nonchalant, nonchalant boldness reminds me as if it happened yesterday. Isn't it moments like this that we live for? That's it. Thanks. Thank the links. <laughs> that was beautiful, Harry. Thank you so much. Thanks. I'm picturing the links in the form of one of your paintings. You never tried to paint the links, did you? No, no, it's just a memory in there, but it was it was pretty cool because they, they could be kind of nasty animals, I guess, but this guy was just doing the same thing I was. He was taking a walk on a Sunday afternoon and it, he had the, the feet just like I had to have the snowshoes, you know, he was able to yeah. do it. It's really cool. Your they description never, was never really smelt me or saw me. I think it's probably more smell. So, yeah, it's the only time I've ever seen one in the woods. You know, mm -hmm. wild bobcats I've seen, but but that's my first and only links. Yeah, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Next up, we have John Henderson. All right, unmuted. Uh, this is, uh, I did not mow the lawn that day. My idea was to mow the lawn. First, however, fallen branches had to be cleared. Turned out that was a much bigger job than I had first imagined. More than one storm had brought down branches. So an hour later, still at it, while bending over to pick up a limb, my iPhone popped out of my pocket. Said I to myself, you didn't even realize you had it in your pocket, did you? That's how you lost it the last time, remember? <laughs> but did I walk back to the house immediately and shed myself of the iPhone? No. My argumentative self convinced me that I was almost done with the job and now I was paying attention. I'd be careful. I was careful. Then soon, the job was done. So I slapped my hand against my breast pocket to confirm my phone was still there. It wasn't, but it had to be. I had been careful. If it had slipped out, I surely would have noticed. I touched my shirt pocket again. Not oddly, the phone was still not there. Fortunately, I knew exactly the path I had taken, back and forth and back and forth. They were the only steps I had taken in close to an hour. 
and my track had been neither far nor wide. A quick look is all it would take. In a moment, I'd see it. A quick look, however, did not recover my iPhone. Nevertheless, I had, it had to be there. I searched again, more carefully. I searched several times, then several more times. No luck. No need to panic though, right? And once I had found it, I thought I might even write a long narrative of my successful, my successful quest. But even with that silly encouragement, I did not, could not find the iPhone. In my search, I moved the entire pile of limbs and brush to a new spot. I had examined the new spot carefully for the missing phone. It was not there. I retraced my steps along the path several more times. Not fruitlessly, since I picked up more limbs, twigs, and some leaf mold along the way and put them in the pile in its new location. It wasn't likely those limbs and twigs would be hiding the lost object, and they weren't. Then I retraced my steps while pulling up tall grass and weeds. The phone refused to be found. All my initial eagerness went into a tailspin. But I did not lose hope. I wasn't done yet. Doesn't everyone praise perseverance? <laughs> I now decided a new strategy was necessary. Hey, we now had fiber optics. It was installed that very morning. I could test the claimed enhanced range of our Wi-Fi. I would locate the phone. I borrowed Margaret's iPhone, but didn't call too soon. I waited until I stood over a likely spot in the grass. Quite a distance from the house, there was still one bar on the Wi-Fi icon. This is stronger indeed, I smiled. <laughs> I dialed. I waited. After a long, frustrating many seconds, I got a message. My call had failed. But the enhanced signal, I tried again. Failure. Walking back to the house, I reminded myself about perseverance. I asked Margaret to call my phone from inside the house. This time, it would work. It had to. But Margaret, please wait. I wanted to be in place before she made the call. Back where I knew the phone just had to be, I hollered to Margaret, whom I could see on the other side of the open window. Now make the call. She made the call. Immediately, I heard my phone ring. What? Immediately, I heard my phone ring. I followed the sound, and after not very many steps, not many steps at all, there it was in plain sight about three feet away from where I had searched multiple times, many multiple times. I had my iPhone. Relief, not just in finding the phone, but in not having to replace all and everything that was stored inside. Phone numbers, passwords, notes, photographs, kittens lapping tongues, and puppy dog tails. Perhaps, now you feel rather exhausted just hearing my tale. Maybe <laughs> that little weariness can provide you a bit of insight to my feeling. My feeling of frustration and exhaustion and frantic anxious emotion and finally almost elation. There's a certain mad terror wordless that I think we all must feel when frantically searching for something lost that can't be produced in retrospect once the treasure's been found. I did not mow the lawn that day. <laughs> oh. 
I'm on the edge of my seat. <laughs> <laughs> there is such dramatic tension. On, you're an incredible reader. <laughs> I read that piece on the website, but like nothing compares to you reading it. That was really, really awesome and so relatable. <laughs> That feeling of, you know, like you said, that anxiety around losing something and then like it dissipates as soon as it's found. And like you, it's like a, um, like a ghost. All right. weird. Yeah, Carol relates too. <laughs> I agree, Nancy. That was such a great, a great reading. Thank you so much, John. Yeah. So next up, we have our friend, another library volunteer, Carol Makoda. You're muted. There. <laughs> I'm going to try to share the screen. Host has disabled participant screen sharing. Okay. That's all right. I, you don't have to. I can read without it. I'm trying. Do you have to make me a co-host or something? Oh, I see. I have to change it to all participants. Now right. it should be cool. All right. Oh, that wasn't yet. I'll start with the one that I submitted, Water Snake Serenity. I walk so early these hot days past penitent, still folded daylilies who hold their floral stems outstretched to where the sun will show itself next, past robins sparring for land rights, empty rentals soon to fill with families, creek beds almost empty, until after a downpour later in the day. I stop near the end of my walk just before the uphill leg to sit on Max's dock and gaze out waiting for poems to come. So still today, no breeze is moving air or water. I see a small dot gliding along the lake's surface. I watch carefully. It is not a poem, nor a muskrat snout, nor a diving duck coming up for air. A water snake, not so big, maybe a foot long if it were straightened out. It is never straight though, but like a constantly shifting sine wave, its entire body winding from side to side at a quiet pace, not hurried, raising no foaming wake or embossed ripples, just the nose above water. With my cell, I video its journey and stand to follow it as it comes close to the dock, stops, to lick the air with vibrating tongue. Despite my aversion, I am spellbound, staring, noticing its green and brown bands, its lazily floating tail. Then it sees me, and when I take a noisy step closer, squeaking on the boards, it withdraws into cooler shadows in the water below me. So that's my um, water snake, which of course has a tail. In this one, there are fish that have tails. Dream revision. Water moves swiftly around me on this unknown river. The speed frightens me a little. My house weighs me down, so I push it overboard and find myself on a raft, dry and safe, watching the shoreline pass by. The cottages along the way are painted in palest pastels, peach, rose, mint, lemon, lilac. My destination is unclear, but it feels right to be floating along at this speed. Time passes, and I witness another astonishing sunrise above the left bank, another fiery sunset to the right. Again and again, fish swim along with my raft, lifting above the water's surface as they nose in. They glow, their scales richly iridescent and radiant. The trees that line the banks lean out from their roots as I pass, and I catch the scent as they exhale. I feel that all is well. I revise my maps.
Jazz club at the bird feeder. Blue Jays on bass, finches with tiny saxophones, flickers with fat piano fingers at the tips of their wings. Hummingbirds dance, sun spotlights Oriole in mid melody. Cowbird backs up singers croon in dark iridescent gowns. And another bird, while you wait, Gaze on waves until you become the wave, pulsing to shore, overturning stone and shell, whispering your hiss and roar into the wind. Listen to the wind until you are the wind itself, covering miles, over woods, lake, city, highway, admitting of no obstacle, veering where you will, sheltering birds on your currents. Watch a bird until you are a bird so high up that the earth shrinks, its agonies receding, replaced by focus on the moment, weather and wind, fish and frog. Your own call will be all that you hear, backed by water and forest a flutter. In the woods, curl your hand around that dry leaf until you are the leaf, poised at the end of a life cycle of spring buds and green summer glory, about to become the minerals, that will feed the ground from which all will grow. Thank you. Wow, Carol. That was beautiful. I loved them all together too. Oh. <laughs> that was really lovely. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks for giving me a chance to, this is really nice. <laughs> Um, and next up is Kelly Leach. I hope I said your last name wrong, right? <laughs> you did say it right. <laughs> That's okay, okay. I just yeah. realized it never came out of my mouth. <laughs> well, I'm excited to be here with so many talented people. I am uh, coming from Iowa and I'm here with my husband and dog. You saw my dog in the beginning. Um, and we've never been to New York, but if we ever go, we'll have, we'll have to come to Lodi. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, <laughs> and meet all of you great folks. So I'm going to screen share, but I'm doing mine a little differently. I'm going to share pictures about each dog that I've written a poem about. Okay. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Okay, great. So this is my first dog, her name is Hannah. And this first poem is titled Hannah and it's just about um, finding comfort even though you know I had her when I was a kid, sometimes I still miss her once in a while. So Hannah, past the cusp of witching hour, she tosses and turns. Her comforter, no comfort. She opens her mouth and the horizon picks up her howls, carrying them to the edge of heaven. Alerted and ears perked, her childhood chocolate Labrador peers down. Hannah remembers their nighttime routine, how she'd follow the girl on the tips of her heels, trusting her owner over the path of the looming darkness. How the girl would bury herself in a cocoon of sheets and pillows, and she'd embody the dozy act, burying her head into the girl's arms. Hannah was built for roaming, but didn't creep toward the dim lit hallway until she felt the, the child and her dreams paved with gold. This night is no different. Hannah was built for what lies beyond rainbows. Hannah rested her paws on the edge of the earth, counting the breaths of her old friend, slowly inching backward as she saw painted dreams splatter over her eyelids. Okay, now I'm going to switch my photo. This is Montana. We call her Moni. She's a Blue Healer Lab mix. Um, she lives with my parents. She's 14 years old. We got her when I was 11. Um, so um, this next poem is about Montana and um, just- Hey, Kelly. Always... Yes. The photo didn't switch for me. Oh, sorry. Let me I just wanted you to know before you began. Okay, is it fixed now? Yeah. Okay, now you can see Moni. <laughs> And this poem is about um, um, struggling at home and just not always feeling safe around my mom. So, and how Montana got me through that. Guarded. 
Through the tremors turned earthquakes, when dusk sank within childhood innocence, I wished upon a refuge. Burying myself in your fur, you let me rest upon your graces, even when I fell asleep in crooked positions. You kept your paws steady, as if to tell me with you, I wouldn't have to worry about the shake. Did the people's savior crown you to guard me against cub-eating wolves? I prayed they would never break your spark of your caramel eyes. I prayed they would never break the spark of your caramel eyes. Thankfully, a spire still sparks when I meet your face with great edges, marked by time sunken in teeth before your train whistle calls. I hope you know by my fingertips scratching your head, I'm saying thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for sharing that, Kelly. I could have just sat here and like looked at pictures of your dog like all night. <laughs> I was like, I want to, I want to swipe. <laughs> I can't. Oh yeah, she's beautiful. <laughs> They're gorgeous and just such awesome sharing about animals. Um, people use that term emotional support animal in such a like kind of throwaway manner, but that is very real, very real. Thank you for sharing that. Rosie. Hi, Anna. Hi, Anna. <laughs> How are you doing tonight, sweetie? Good. I feel like I just saw you. <laughs> Rosie. You're trying to find Rosie. your doggy. Rosie. <laughs> Anna, next week, I think we're going to work on some dog poetry. Yes. Sweetheart, what I'm going to have you do is turn, turn off your sound. Can you mute your sound, hun? Uh -huh. Okay, great. <laughs> so last up is me. <laughs> I have two poems to share with you tonight. One of them is on the website called Foxy. The other one is called What If Love? And unfortunately, I didn't realize until later that it's, not, it's about an octopus and octopuses actually don't have tails. So it's funny that I'm the one that violates the theme <laughs> as the one who put out the theme. <laughs> but it's a fun poem anyway. What if love? What if love has eight arms? In turn, whirling and curling, independent and interdependent, kissing and caressing, grabbing and drawing, incurring small welts, broken capillaries for good cause. Every appendage is its own master, each having their own sentience and temperament. Some ar arms are more goal-oriented than others. Some serve to dazzle and distract. Some are cool and patient, while others are fiery and impulsive but all searching, hungry, moving. What if love has three hearts? One for private desires, cloaked in camouflage, imitating the murky depths of the sea, misty and mottled and not at all transparent. One heart for another, bubbling up to crimson horned skin, emerging, emerging with playful siphons of seawater, exposing tenderest of underbelly, evident on the sleeve of all eight arms. Lastly, the practical heart, for love encompasses all three, steadfastly pumping copper-enriched blood, as blue and as infinite as the sky. What if love is a mighty hunter, curious and agile, intelligent, and swiftly propelled through its element? capable of capture and deceit, capable of appearing to be whatever is advantageous at the time. What if love has alien eyes, inscrutable and incomparable, very unhuman-like, with their subdued horizontal dashes giving away nothing, yet clearly noticing everything? Perhaps love knows too much, privy to every vibration, and change in composition, 
compiling and interpreting, remembering and integrating, requiring rest and dark conditions and a bone white exterior just to take it all in, to make sense of it at all before senility and biology and mortality have their way. What if love has an inviolate kernel of truth within? Whereas the rest is flowing, shifting and shapeless, negotiating the smallest of cracks and crevices, limitless and beyond expectation, both liquid and solid, effortlessly pouring itself into any container and yet able to escape them all. Oh, <laughs> it will have to be a tale, T-A-L-E. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> We're roping me in there. <laughs> and this is my foam foxy about foxes that have tails. I've been thinking about foxes a lot, mostly in pictures. My thoughts, I mean, the foxes aren't in pictures. The foxes are free, unframed, doing fox things. I see foxes, like flames licking frosty expanses, like deep orange comets or afternoon suns crossing the horizon, or as an assemblage of shapes, a lovely and familiar geometry, pleasing and simple, Triangle ears, teardrop rump, level end to end like a well-executed yoga move. Quick, dainty feet, luxurious tail, an aspirational Disney ponytail with perfect volume and balance. Face, <laughs> an alluring, exotic, canine, feline mix. Angular, yet appealing. Whiskers cascading in an impossible symmetry. Foxy. Breaking into this reverie, I am reminded of the fox that I actually saw in real life as it was crossing the uncertain puddled terrain of a residential neighborhood, scruffy and unkept, mud flicked and jaunty, <laughs> its color a barely glowing coal against the, the slush. I can relate to her sagging bottom and her bristly tail, ears none too pert, her hungry face with features decidedly too sharp for beauty. Is she an example of a bad fox? Am I a bad example of a woman? <laughs> Maybe. It turns out that we were both actually good examples of something else entirely, something not yet conceived, a picture we have not even considered, a form we have yet to appreciate. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, guys, it was really great to gather with all of you guys tonight. <laughs> Nancy likes the foxes too. Oh, Carol wants me to write an animal book. Only if you'll write it with me, baby. Put that on the list. <laughs> Now that you're published, you can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'll rent you my links. All right. <laughs> I want all of you to have a really great night. But first, I just want to open it to anything that anybody else wants to share. Like, it's open floor time. Teresa, do you want to read a poem? No. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, what? <laughs> There's a Sheila here. Sheila, would you like to read a poem? Hi, Sheila. <laughs> Thank you. I haven't written poetry since I was a teenager. I'm a friend of Carol's and I just wanted to take advantage of a chance to hear good literature, good poetry. So thank you for having this so I could join. Thanks for coming, Sheila. My pleasure. Yes, thank, for, thank you for coming, Sheila. All right, guys. All of you have a great night. It was so nice to meet you, Kelly. That's so cool. You too, Sheila. Anna. Thank you again, Nora. That was wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting me.
Sure. It was that was nice really to fun. meet all of you too. And thank you for putting this together, Nora. Sure. Where's the cat? <laughs> bye, Anna. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, Bye, Anna. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.